Good morning, Representative Wither. Do you mind doing an audio check for us? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You sound great. Thank you so much. Thank you. You are online, so is Mr. Garcia. We are waiting on our last witness, Mr. Wayne Cortez. If you'd like, uh, we can get started on time and then we can work on uh, making sure he can access the platform as the hearing continues. Just give me about one more minute here and then we can get going. All right, you, we will begin the 30 second countdown and you will hear a verbal countdown from 10. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. The subcommittee on oversight and investigations will come to order. The subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on opioids in tribal communities. Under committee rule 4F, any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the chair and the ranking minority member or their designees. This will allow us to hear from our witnesses sooner and help keep members to their schedules. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they are submitted to the clerk by 5 p.m. today or the close of the hearing, whichever comes first. Hearing no objection, so ordered. Without objection, the chair may also declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. As described in the notice, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository at hnrcdocs at mail.house.gov. Additionally, please note that as with in-person hearings, members are responsible for their own microphones. As with our in-person meetings, members can be muted by staff only to avoid inadvertent background noise. Finally, members or witnesses experiencing technical problems should inform committee staff immediately. I want to start this hearing by congratulating my colleague Blake Moore um, on becoming the new ranking member of this subcommittee. We've been able to find common ground in with the previous ranking member, and I'm optimistic that we can continue that good working relationship as we make the return to hybrid hearings. I would also like to take a moment to pay tribute to former Natural Resources Chair Don Young. Representative Young was a longtime champion on tribal issues, and his hard work advocating for Alaska Natives will not be forgotten. Today, we will hear from tribal leaders about the opioid crisis in their community, communities. Opioids are harming tribal communities more than any other group in our nation. Before COVID-19, Native Americans were almost 50% more likely to die of an opioid overdose than members of any other demographic group. During the pandemic, while American Indian and Alaska Natives were getting sick and dying at some of the highest rates in our country, 
opioids claimed even more lives. Opioid overdose deaths during the pandemic increased more in Native American communities than in communities for any other racial or ethnic group. American Indians and Alaska Natives have kept their cultures and governments alive through centuries of colonial violence, dispossession, and forced assimilation. Today, opioids are another assault on tribal cultures, separating families, claiming lives, and disrupting ways of life. Tribal public services are stretched to the breaking point, dealing with the consequences of opioid addiction. First responders are overwhelmed with drug-related calls. Entire families are made homeless by drug-related evictions. And scarce health care resources are being diverted into opioid treatment and response. The federal government is legally required to deliver health care to all tribal people. This fiduciary trust obligation is a promise a promise that the United States made in hundreds of treaties with tribal nations in return for land and peace. It has been codified into law and it has been upheld by the courts. But the U.S. government has never delivered on this promise. Due to decades of underfunding, the Indian Health Service, IHS, can spend only $3,779 per patient. This compares to the national average of $9,409 per person. The Indian Health Service is so underfunded compared to other federal health care programs that the U.S. Civil Rights Commission called it either, quote, intentional discrimination or gross negligence, quote. Delayed or denied health care results in American Indians and Alaska Natives living sicker and dying younger than other Americans. Only one in eight American Indians who need substance abuse treatment get it. Our failure to deliver on our nation's promise costs lives. It costs marriages, it orphans children, it robs communities of elders and the wisdom they hold, and it drives families into poverty. To address this crisis, we need to provide more resources for tribal governments and urban Indian health organizations to treat the opioid epidemic. The treatment and prevention programs run by tribes are effective and cost efficient, and they center the local needs and cultures of the tribal citizens they serve. Unfortunately, federal funding for tribal health care has been woefully insufficient. Base funding for tribal health systems through IHS is far too restrictive. It can take years and an act of Congress to take simple steps such as remodeling a facility. Grants have not been much better. Competitive grants needlessly pit tribal governments against other tribal governments and the administrative costs of running grant programs divert funds from patient care. Congress needs to provide long-term sustainable funding for tribal-run treatment and prevention programs if we want to truly combat the scourge of opioids in Native American communities. I'm pleased that we have Mr. Wayne Cortez as a witness testifying today. Mr. Cortez is a peer support specialist at Riverside San Bernardino County Indian Health, and he has seen firsthand the need for more resources to address this epidemic. I commend his work in Southern California, and I'm grateful for his bravery in sharing his story today. Tribal citizens across the United States are working to heal their communities on their own terms. It is time that Congress supported them. Before I yield to the ranking member, I want to apologize that I'm not going to be able to attend the rest of this hearing. And I want to thank Representative Garcia, a champion for just and healthy communities in every part of this country, for serving as the chair in my absence. I'm now prepared to yield to ranking member Moore for his opening statement. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Porter. Thanks for the, uh, the note of congratulations as well, um, and more importantly, your comments about the late uh, Representative Don Young. Don Young was an individual that cared deeply about this institution. My first conversations with him reflected um, his desire for, for good working order and for us to be able to um, find ways to solve some of America's biggest problems. So thank you for that, that note. Uh, first, before I give my remarks, I ask unanimous consent that Mr. Rosendale of Montana, Mr. Gonzalez of Texas, and Mr. Biggs of Arizona be allowed to participate in today's hearing. So ordered. Thank you. And again, thank you. 
Today's hearing on the opioid crisis draws attention to a, a somber milestone for our nation. Tragically, a record-breaking number of more than 100,000 people in the United States died of a drug overdose between April 2020 and April 2021 in one calendar year. In other words, approximately 274 Americans died each day from drugs during the last 12 months. This crisis is impacting communities across the United States. In 2014, my home state of Utah was hit particularly hard by the opioid pandemic. We had the fourth highest number of overdose deaths in the nation. My state then dedicated resource to combat the epidemic and significantly decrease overdose, overdose deaths. I think we all can agree that treatment options and education are important aspects of addressing the opioid e epidemic, but these steps alone are not enough. To effectively combat this opioid crisis, we must disrupt the supply of drugs flowing into our communities and address the clear threats cartels pose to our neighborhoods and tribal communities. The American Medical Association identified three, three drugs, fentanyl, methamphetamine, and cocaine, as the drugs driving the ob overdose epidemic. These are the very same drugs that agents are seizing at our southern border. In this fiscal year alone, U.S. Customs and Border Protection reports confiscating more than 4,200 pounds of fentanyl, more than 77,000 pounds of methamphetamine, and more than 23,000 pounds of cocaine. These outrageous numbers should alarm anyone who cares about this crisis. Cartels are responsible for bringing these drugs into our communities. The, the Drug Enforcement Agency's 2020 National Drug Threat Assessment identified Mexican transnational criminal organizations as, quote, the greatest drug trafficking threat to the United States, end quote. Additionally, the DEA identified Mexican criminal organizations as the primary source of illicit substance on Indian reservations. Not only do the cartels make drugs available on reservations, but they also exploit tribal lands in their trafficking efforts. For example, the Tauhonau Oadam Reservation, colloquially also referred to as TO Reservation, covers about 4% of the southwest border. Mexican cartels utilize the remoteness of the highways on this reservation to traffic drugs across the border. To combat, cartels operation, to combat the cartel's operations and protect American families, we must ensure our law enforcement officers have the support they need. In addition to the work of Border, control, border Patrol agents, we've seen the effectiveness of targeted policing efforts. For example, in 2018, the Interior Department created the Joint Opioid Task Force to address the threat opioids pose to tribal communities. The following year, the task force reported seizing more than 2,000 pounds of illegal narcotics. During one operation, the task force disrupted a Mexican cartel's smuggling efforts with the TO, TO Nation and confiscated 30,000 fentanyl pills. Law enforcement operations for drug inter interdiction, however, also necessitates increased border security. Mr. Art Del Cuito joins us today. Uh, he's a 19-year veteran Border Patrol agent. From his experience patrolling the TO Reservation, Mr. Mr. Koto will provide the committee with firsthand account of the crisis at the southern border and associated cartel activity. As the Department of Homeland Security prepares for yet another surge of people attempting to cross the border, we must call attention to all the consequences of President Biden's decisions. One of those consequences is diverting Border Patrol agents from their post to assist with processing of illegal immigrants. As a result, cartels are given a prime opportunity to evade detection and traffic illicit drugs across the border. After exploiting our nation's open border, cartels will, will funnel deadly drugs into the nation. Until our southern border is secured and cartel activity is curtailed, the opioid crisis will rage on. If we want to end the crisis, we must get the people the help they need to recover, but that's only part of it. We need to secure the border, prevent drug smuggling, and cut off the supply killing American communities. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ranking Member. And now I'd like to turn to our witness panel. Uh, before introducing the witnesses, I will remind them that they are encouraged to participate in the witness diversity survey created by the Congressional Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Witnesses may refer to their hearing invitation materials for further information. Let me remind the witnesses that under our committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but that uh, their entire statement will appear in the hearing record. When you begin, the timer will start and I will turn 
and it will turn orange when you have one minute remaining and red when your time has expired. I recommend that member members and witnesses joining remotely pin their timer so that it remains visible. After your testimony is complete, please remember to mute yourself to avoid any inadvertent background noise. I will also allow the entire panel to testify before questioning witnesses. The chair now recognizes the Honorable Chuck Hoskin, Jr., Principal Chief of the Cherokee Nation. Well, no, uh, Chair Porter, I know she couldn't stay, but I appreciate her introduction. Ranking Member, member Moore, uh, Chairman Grijalva, uh, Ranking Member uh, Westerman, uh, Acting Chair Garcia, and distinguished members of this subcommittee. We appreciate you holding uh, this important hearing. It's my honor to speak with you today on behalf of the 410,000 citizens of the great Cherokee Nation. Uh, for two decades, the opioid epidemic, ep epidemic has affected every facet of our society, from our economy, to our health system, to schools, to our families. The pharmaceutical industry flooded the communities within our reservations, reservation with hundreds of millions of pills. Hundreds of Cherokee citizens have died from overdoses as a consequence. Tens of thousands more have suffered. In one year, approximately 184 million opioid pills were distributed within the Cherokee Nation Reservation. This is enough to supply every person living in our reservation with 153 pills each in one year. Cherokee Nation is less than 6% of Oklahoma's population, yet nearly a third of the opioids were distributed in this, that were distributed in the state went into our communities. And this was no accident. <clears throat> the multi-generational trauma that still lingers within our communities made Cherokee Nation and the Cherokee people a prime target. The pharmaceutical industry knew our history and it exploited it for profit. The number of opioid pills shipped into our communities far exceeded the national average, and it was eclipsed only by the amount that was shipped into Appalachia. Today, a Cherokee adult is more likely to die of an overdose than to die in a car accident. Across Indian country, the number of overdose deaths increased by 500% between 1999 and 2015. Five years ago, we sued the country's largest distributors and pharmacies for their role in targeting Cherokee Nation and flooding our communities with prescription opioids. This landmark case was the first brought by a Native American tribe. We wanted this case not only to bring justice to our tribe, but to be a precedent for other tribal nations fighting the opioid epidemic. Last year, we settled with the main distributors, McKesson, Amerisource, Bergen, and Cardinal Health for $75 million to be paid over six and a half years. Earlier this year, we settled with Johnson & Johnson for $18 million over two years. Our claims against Walmart, Walgreens, and CVS remain pending. We believe these pharmacy chains also greatly contributed to the crisis. With these settlements, we will increase our investments in substance, uh, substance use disorder, mental health treatment, and other programs to help our people recover. This work is needed now more than ever as increased isolation, health fears, and economic insecurities brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic have heightened anxiety among our people and increased the rates of self-medication. My administration plans to put 15 million of our settlement dollars towards the construction of drug treatment facilities over the next three years, a minimum of 15 million. These treatment centers will help bring about transformational change and provide some measure of justice by bringing healing to our people using funds from the very industry that injured us. But the settlement funds alone will not be enough to end the opioid crisis. We need the federal government to fulfill its trust obligation to tribes and fully fund these vital programs to help our tri tribal citizens uh, recover from addiction and access behavioral health services. One of the most significant gaps that we face is prevention 
in the workforce. Without a significant investment in building a highly trained prevention workforce, we'll continue to be unable to plug hole, just plug holes in the dam rather than repair the issues causing the leaks. We need tribal workforce development programs. We need non-competitive funding for community-based prevention efforts. We need to tr return to our traditional communal values so that we can address the effects of addiction for the next generation. We need supportive services. We need the government of the United States to meet its obligation. Frankly, we need the United States to follow the lead of the Cherokee Nation as we lead in efforts to heal our people and address this epidemic. What up? Thank you, uh, Chair Hoskin, for that uh, testimony. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Art Del Cueto, Vice President of the Western Region of the National Border Patrol Council. Mr. Del Cueto, you are on. Chair Porter, Acting Chair Garcia, Ranking Member Moore, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, I would like to thank you for inviting me to testify before you today. I hope that my testimony will assist the subcommittee in better understanding how the executive actions taken by President Biden and his administration have directly resulted in an increase in illicit fentanyl coming across our southern borders with Mexico and into our communities, including vulnerable tribal communities. My name is Art Del Cueto. I currently serve as Vice President of the Western Region of the National Border Patrol Council, where I represent Border Patrol field agents and support staff. I was born on the border, I grew up on the border, and I have more than 18 years of experience as a Border Patrol agent as well as a thorough understanding of the policies affecting border security and illicit, illicit narcotics trafficking. Throughout my career in Border Patrol, I have served in the Tucson sector and have personally engaged in narcotic enforcement activities in and around tribal communities in Southern Arizona. Since he took office in January of last year, the policies enacted by President Biden and his Department of Homeland Security have directly resulted in the least secure border that I have observed in my 18 year career. Due to the Biden administration's border and immigration policies, we have seen historically high numbers of individuals, families, and children illegally crossing the border over the past year, which has forced the Border Patrol to dedicate more than 50% of its resources to activities other than patrolling the border, creating gaps on our border. Criminal cartels have consistently exploited these gaps over the, over the past year and have been able to easily cross high-value products such as illegal aliens and special interest countries, weapons and narcotics in massive quantities. The amount of illicit fentanyl and synthetic opioids pouring into our country across our southern border is staggering and frankly terrifying, knowing that just two milligrams is considered a lethal dose. According to publicly available data from Customs and Border Protection, the Border Patrol seized over 1,000 pounds of fentanyl nationwide from February of 2021, the first full month of President Biden's open border policies, to February of 2022. The Tucson sector accounted for over 40% of that figure, which amounted to 427 pounds of fentanyl seized by Tucson agents. To give some perspective to that figure, 427 pounds of fentanyl converts to over 193 million milligrams, enough to potentially kill over 96 million people. With agents forced to cross this huge number of traffic and unable to patrol the border, and criminal cartels are now consistently exploiting the situation. These circumstances have led to a huge increase in the flow of hard narcotics making their way into the U.S. and wrecking havoc on communities as, as drug overdoses soar to over 100,000 annually. In September of last year, eight months after President Biden's open border policies went into the effect, the DEA issued a public safety alert warning that sharp increase in fake prescription pills containing fentanyl and methamphetamines. The DEA administrator Ann Milgram stated in the alert that the United States is facing an unprecedented crisis of overdose deaths fueled by illegally manufactured fentanyl. The alert goes on to allude that the fact that fentanyl is illegally being trafficked across our southern border with Mexico. They say, the vast majority of counterfeit pills brought into the United States are produced in Mexico and China is supplying chemicals for the manufacturing of fentanyl into Mexico. While the alert only implies that lethal doses of fentanyl are being illegally smuggled into the U.S. across the southern border with Mexico and uses the word brought, the DEA's own facts about fentanyl webpage makes the situation very clear. As illicit fentanyl streams into the country at a horrifying rate, sadly, tribal communities are not immune. 
Where I work in the Tucson sector, there's a long history of illicit narcotics trafficking on the Tohono O'odham Nation, the land that shares the border with Mexico. According to information shared publicly by the Tohono O'odham Nation Department of Public Safety in 2017, from 20, 2002 to 2016, the Tohono O'odham Police Department and Border Patrol worked to seize over 313,000 pounds of drugs. In 2019, ABC News made a public year-long investigation on smuggling activities on the nation and called the tribal land one of the busiest corridors in North America. Tribal leader David Garcia is quoted on a report saying, we're killing our own people. We have to do something. And if we don't do anything, we're just as bad within the problem. Garcia stated that a lot of the tribal members are involved in drug smuggling of migrants and drugs. I've worked in and around this area. Mr. Garcia is absolutely correct especially on the list of narcotics like fentanyl that are constantly coming through the Tohono O'odham Nation. And just like communities all over the country, when narcotics come in, the outcomes are devastating for tribal members. As, long as, as one example of fentanyl seized by the nation in 2019, Bureau of Land Affairs forced to seize 30,000 fentanyl pills as part of the investigation. The subcommittee and Congress do not need to enact new legislation or appropriate money to address this issue. Thankfully, we have laws on the books that we need to stop this growing public health, humanitarian and national security crisis. And we have more than enough funding appropriate to DHS each year to do so. We need, simply need a change in policy. It starts with policy, and President Biden's policies have made our borders the least secure in our nation. I want to thank the subcommittee for your time <clears throat> for answering any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Del Cueto. Uh, the chair uh, will now recognize Ms. Maureen Rosette, a board member of the National Council on Urban Indian Health. Ms. Rosette. Good morning. My name is Maureen Rosette, and I am a citizen of the Ch Chippewa Cree Nation and serve as a board member for NACUM, National Council of Urban Indian Health, which represents the 41 urban Indian health care organizations across the nation who provide high quality, culturally competent care to urban Indians, constituting over 70% of all American Indians, Alaska Natives. I'm also the Chief Operating Officer at the Native Project, an urban Indian organization located in Spokane, Washington. Let me start by saying thank you to Chairwoman Porter, Ranking Member Moore, and members of the subcommittee to share how the opioid crisis is plaguing our Native communities, communities and to request inclusion of urban Indian organizations referred to as UIOs in the critical opioid response funding. The codified declaration of national Indian health policy, policy states that is, it is the policy of this nation in fulfillment of its trust responsibilities and legal obligations to Indians to ensure the highest possible health status for Indians and urban, Indi urban Indians to provide all resources necessary to affect that policy. In fulfillment of this policy, the Indian Health Service funds three health, pro health programs to provide health care to Native people, IHS sites, tribal sites, and urban Indian organizations, referred to as the ITU system. Unfortunately, the system has been hampered by decades of chronic underfunding. Additionally, while the majority of the Native popul population resides in ur urban areas, only 1% of the entire Indian health budget is provided for urban Indian health. Our UIO, the Native Project, provides medical, dental, behavioral health, pharmacy, Care coordination, wellness, and prevention services. Our patients include Native people from over 300 different tribes. This year, we've had virtual wellness like nights with activities like powwow, dancing, painting, regalia making, planting, and cooking, where we bring to life the meaning behind culture is medicine. Along with the 40 other UIOs, we play a critical role in addressing the opioid crisis impacting Native communities. A review of one UIO records from 2018 to 2021 showed that over 80% of clients that engage in behavioral health services had co-occurring mental health and substance abuse disorders. Opioid disorder was the most common substance abuse diagnosis. However, as we will illustrate today, UIOs are cut off from critical funding resources designed to help Native communities, negatively impacting the health outcomes for urban Indians. Additionally, the opioid crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic are intersecting with each other and presenting unprecedented challenges for Native families and communities. A study found that one out of every 168 na Native children experienced orphanhood or death of caregivers due, the, due to the pandemic. Native children were four times more likely than white children to lose a parent or, 
or grandparent caregiver. This has exacerbated mental health and substance use issues among our youth. During the last government shutdown, one UIO suffered 12 opioid overdoses, 10 of which were fatal. This represents 10 relatives who are no longer part of our community. These are mothers, fathers, uncles, and aunties no longer present in the lives of our families. These are tribal relatives unable to pass along the cultural traditions that make us as Native people who we are. To address the opioid overdose epidemic in Indian country, Congress has provided funding for tribal opioid response grants. We have long advocated for UIOs to be added to these grants given the extent of the impact of the opioid epidemic on all American Indians and Alaska Natives, regardless of residence. However, the final language in the omnibus removed UIOs as eligible, so UIOs like mine working against the same column are again left without the resources. This is a failure of equity and the trust responsibility. Therefore, I want to emphasize the importance of explicitly mentioning urban Indian organizations and legislation to ensure funding designed to reach Native communities actually does. As one advocate stated, the language everywhere has to include the word urban. They have to say it, they have to write it, and then it will reach a critical mass eventually because they don't get it, you know, we're just invisible. In conclusion, more needs to be done to address the opioid crisis, ensure that all Natives have access to life-saving health care. I urge Congress to take this obligation seriously and provide UIOs with all the resources necessary to protect, protect the lives of the entirety of the Native population, regardless of where they live. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I provide a written testimony to the committee and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Rosette, for your testimony. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Wayne Cortez, peer support specialist at Riverside San Bernardino County Indian Health, Inc. Mr. Cortez. Hey, good morning. Good morning to all of you. A uh, little bit of time difference, but uh, thank uh, the two guests that spoke before me. Uh, yeah, my name is Wayne Cortez. I'm from Torres Martinez, Desert Coe Indians here in Riverside County. You know, uh, we're talking about the opiate epidemics here. You know, I see it on a daily basis down here, you know, uh, being that peer support specialist. Yeah, we, we do have a problem here, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, opiates do not discriminate. You know, it's, it's in every family member that deal with that kind of drug there. Uh, yeah, um, for me, I would like to see a lot of changes, you know, um, more education and with this crisis here. But for me, being in that lived experience, I lived that life right there. Uh, 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 I used a heroin addict, you know, for over 30 some years now. So, you know, uh, it really bothers me to hear a lot of uh, stuff about uh, Native Americans, uh, uh, the problem with it there. You know, it's not coming from inside the reservation. It's coming from outside the communities. You know, I live in an area where it's a pipeline uh, in the Coachella Valley area, you know, uh, right there next to Mex uh, Mexicali. But, you know, uh, a lot of these uh, so-called drug dealers, cartel members, you know, they use Native Americans because of the revenue that we do get. They feed off of us a lot, you know. So, but <clears throat> for me, being being in that peer support, you know, bringing the education to them, uh, you know, encouraging them to do a better job in their life, you know, uh, helping their kids, supporting them, you know, in, in school, you know, just being that mentor, uh, father, brother, son, you know, uncle, you know, even, even as a grandparent, you know, you know, I encourage a lot of the uh, Native people in my community to step up, you know, and teach them that culture more, you know, get them involved in the communities, you know, get them involved in the uh, different tribes, you know, because we have nine different reservations down here, you know, and it's very important, but we, you know, I being here in Riverside County, you know, I've seen a lot of this uh, so-called fent fentanyl uh, epidemic. I've seen how a lot of the, um, you know, the drugs are getting more creative nowadays, you know, through vape pens, through pill form. They got like 10 different names just for uh, fentanyl alone, you know. So, you know, just bringing that, bringing that awareness, bringing that, you know, some uh, 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 light to the subject here. You know, it, it's very, uh, like I said, it's very important. You know, I just want to say uh, thank you for everybody, you know, to uh, hearing what they have to say today. You know, um, it's not going to stop, you know. It's not going to stop until we all acknowledge it. You know, this is something that continues to go on and on. You know, it's like I, I'm not reading. I'm not sitting here reading from something that I, I've written. I'm reading. I'm coming from, you know, my heart lived experience here, you know, and 
you know, I don't know, you know, all I can say is that, you know, it's just uh, something that needs to be addressed more. You know, it's uh, just thank the whole committee here for giving me this opportunity. You know, um, it's, it's early morning and, and to get going, you guys are better suited than me. But, you know, it's like I said, you know, uh, this is not going to go away. You know, this drug does not discriminate. You know, it, it doesn't, you know, so how can we how can we be part of the change? How can we be part of the solution? How can we make this thing, uh, you know, a little bit more understanding that, you know, we can kind of slow it down? It's not going to go away. That's all I can say. You know, um, yeah, usually we start off with a prayer. You know, today I, I had to say some prayers to help me, to help me, give me the right things to say, the right things to do. You know, how can we open up, uh, you know, Congress's eyes? How can we open up the people that, you know, we're representing's eyes, you know, to make them listen to that, you know, close them doors when they try to come up, you know, to the reservations, you know, um, you know, it's just a big struggle. It's just, a, it's a struggle, you know, uh, like I said, I really appreciate you guys' time, just hearing just a little bit from me, you know, um, and the rest of the, the committee here. And, you know, like I said, if you guys have any questions or anything, feel free to ask, you know, but we do stay in culture here, sweat lodges, you know, uh, bird singing, bird dancing, uh, we do, you know, all night wakes. We know we have a lot of things going on down here. We do uh, spend a lot of time with the kids, though. The kids are our future. That's my passion, is the kids helping them to understand that they have a purpose in life, you know, not to give up on them, but to walk beside them, you know, to teach them, teach them something more important than sitting there picking up a can or picking up that, that needle or picking up, you know, that pipe right there. So for me, yeah, you know, I, I really appreciate this. But if there's anything that I can do for my tribe, I'm going to do it, you know, or just any people in general. You know, that's what I'm here for, just to, to get that message across to people, you know. So I really thank you guys. And if, like I said, if you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cortez, for your testimony. And, of course, I want to thank uh, all of the uh, panelists for their testimony. I'd like to remind uh, members that uh, Committee Rule 3D imposes a five-minute limit on questions. The chair uh, will now recognize members uh, for any questions that they may wish uh, to ask. But before uh, I uh, begin, uh, I request unanimous consent that the following uh, members of Congress be authorized to question the witnesses in today's hearing, uh, New Mexico Representative uh, Stansbury. So without objection, so ordered, I now like to recognize myself for five minutes of questions. Uh, first, uh, Chief Hoskin and Ms. Rosette, why is a tribally administered care for opioid addiction more effective than care that is non-tribally run? So Representative, if, if I could respond. Uh, I think it comes down to something essential in healthcare in Indian country, which is we know the people that we serve. We're experts uh, about our own families. There's something about Native peoples delivering healthcare to Native peoples that's not only special, but I think effective. Uh, we share with, uh, whether if we're a healthcare practitioner, we share, or a policymaker, we share with those patients the same historic trauma. You know, we've been through this together for generations. That sense of self that we have is important. Now, there are unique aspects of healthcare in Indian country that go beyond the issues of substance abuse to other health ailments that are unique to Indian country or exacerbated in Indian country. Uh, and our healthcare practitioners know this. Treating people from a holistic standpoint is something we aim to do at the Cherokee Nation. And I think healthcare delivery uh, by tribes directly is important. Of course, that means we need that stream of revenue flowing from the government of the United States so that we can meet uh, that health care obligation. But I think in no area is it more important than dealing with substance abuse, and we have a great deal of work to do. Thank you. Ms. Rosette? Yes, I would echo, echo what um, Chief Hoskins said. We are definitely um, subject matter experts of our own people. And so I believe I mean, we, could, we would be providing culturally focused care and traditional healing practices that no other type of um, healthcare system would be able to provide. And we know our patients. And so that's, that's the best way to treat them is by knowing your patients. Thank you. 
Thank you uh, for that. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Cortez, uh, first, thank you for uh, your courage in coming here to tell your story. Uh, it must be so powerful for those struggling with opioid addiction to know uh, someone with your lived experience uh, and that you have their back. I want to ask you to help us understand more about the process. Uh, when someone seeks treatment to beat their addiction to opioids, what are their struggles and how do you help them overcome those struggles? And would you please uh, walk us through that process for you and for them, if you would? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times they just want to be heard. You know, just listening to them, you know, uh, building that relationship, letting them know that you're going to walk beside them, whether they succeed or fail, identifying their strengths, you know, um, let them know that I care. A lot of times they uh, been through a lot all their life through trauma, you know, um, that's something that's uh, not said enough is that I care. You know, uh, helping them, bringing them to the lodge, helping them to get that healing. You know, a lot of times they're not ready to surrender. Dealing with opiates, it, it's hard dealing with that. You know, it's not easy, you know, uh, taking that first step. You know, uh, they have to want it. They have to want this. It's something that's a bad sickness, you know, dealing with it from my, from my lived experience. It took me over 30 some years just to overcome that, you know, it, it was a lot to, to, to process. But for me, you know, not giving up on my people, being there for them, educating them what's out there, you know, just encouraging them that they do have a purpose in life, you know, in a traditional way, you know, and as a, as a member, a uh, tribal member, but also as a friend, you know, you have to build that relationship with them. You know, it's very important that consistency being there because a lot of times they they were abandoned, you know, but not to give up on them. No. Yes, thank you. Thank you uh, for that. And uh, very briefly, I want to ask uh, Ms. Rosette, uh, what services could urban Indian uh, organizations provide to fight opioid addiction if they had more funding? Again, um, we, would, we would be providing um, culturally focused care and traditional healing practices that are tailored to combat the specific health disparity of Indian health programs. Um, but, and the problem with us is it's the money always, we have to be able to hire more people, but there's this, there, because of the, our, we only get our 1% of the IHS budget. So that's the problem. We don't, we, we don't get enough resources ever because we're urban Indian organizations. Thank you uh, for that. Uh, I'd now like to uh, recognize uh, the ranking member uh, for his uh, time to ask questions. Uh, Representative Moore. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Uh, Mr. Del Cueto, thanks for taking the time to, to be here today. Thanks for, for sharing us with, with this committee the reality of your experience, the reality of President Biden's um, border policies, that simple changes were made that, that increased volume in all sorts of different areas from just the amount of traffic versus uh, with, with respect to uh, to drugs as well coming across our southern, southern border. Your testimony describes the gaps in coverage that are created when agents are tasked with processing migrants. Can you share how cartels exploit these gaps to bring drugs like fentanyl, cocaine, and methamphetamine into our country? Yes, uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Ranking Member Moore. So what has been happening and happens frequently lately is the cartels have been working the southern border and they've been working for quite some time. They control what comes in through the gaps, they control what comes in specifically between the ports of entry. So what they have been doing is knowing that, you know, if they bring across large groups, agents are gonna have to respond. They're going to have to remove those individuals from that area. They're gonna have to take them to a processing center. The cartels are aware of that. And they tell the, the illegal migrants that are entering the country you don't have to worry because you're going to get released anyway. So they turn themselves in, in large numbers. The cartels wait for that to happen. As they see that border patrol agents are now distracted or now have to deal with processing and transporting these individuals at the processing sites, that is when 
the drug cartels take full advantage to bring product across, which is more drugs. And I will add that at the same time, you know, the number of gotaways uh, has gone up in the southern border. And it is then when agents have been distracted, when agents are out in the processing centers, that they'll bring in not only drugs, but many, many in other individuals that we know nothing about who they are or what country they are. It's causing a lot of problems, obviously, on the reservation, specifically the Tohono O'odham Reservation. But those drugs are not just staying on the reservation, they're going throughout the rest of America. Thank you. Um, Chair, I've got two reports here, one from the, the Drug Enforcement Agency and one from the Department of Interior that simply highlight that um, the traffickers were responsible for most illicit drugs on Indian reservations. And they also detail how Mexican TCOs, these criminal organizations, took advantage of reservation land. We'd like to submit these two uh, reports for the record. No objection. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Del Cueto, in, in continuing on with that, based on your work on the Tucson sector of the southern border, can you describe how drug smuggling activities have, have impacted the TO nation? It's, it's impacted it in many ways. You know, you see the individuals on the reservation themselves that are involved in the illicit drugs. I talk to people down here all the time. And as I said earlier in my statement, I grew up here. I grew up down here on this land. I grew up right next to the Tohono O'odham Reservation. And, you know, you speak to them and you see them and, and they'll tell you themselves that there's a problem. They don't want to be caught in that situation. They don't want to be involved in drugs. But unfortunately, you know, the government doesn't do enough to allow Border Patrol to work those areas, to work that land. If you look at some of the gaps that have been done when the wall was being built down on the southern border, that area on the Tejada Autumn Nation, the wall wasn't built and there's several gaps. Now, a lot of people are gonna say, you know, the wall wouldn't have stopped a lot of it anyway, but the reality is it would create a funnel and then it allows the agency to be able to use their resources and put them in areas where it can help. Right now, the Tohono O'odham Nation is a bonanza for the drug cartels bringing heroin, meth, and fentanyl into our country. Thank you. Thanks for that, uh, that perspective. Mr. Cortez, I wanted to just finish. I just want to say sincerely, thank you for your candid testimony. Um, this is affecting numerous different tribes uh, across in various in, in, in reservations from where we've seen the Lumi Nation, the Blackfeet Nation, all have quotes of this is the worst one yet. That you are getting at the point we're trying to make. We can't just throw money at the problem. We really have to stop the flow. Any any last you know additional thoughts um, to to share about how stopping the flow can help improve this situation? That's got to come within the tribe. You know, that's got to come with, you know, a lot of the tribal tribal members, you know, when they have their general meetings, they got to bring awareness of what's going on. They can't just, you know, uh, brush it under the rug, you know, <clears throat> comes from a lot of tribal members marrying outside their, their race, you know, uh, and that, that creates an avenue, you know, they get caught up in it, they get manipulated in it. So, you know, it, it you know, that's a hard one. It really is a hard one, you know. So we just got to, you know, really bring more of understanding what's going on, you know, but it's not going to stop, you know, it, it, the way things are now, that's my, this is my, my, the way I look at it, you know, it's always going to be there. We can slow it down. They're going to, they're going to find other ways to do it. You know, it's a not, it's, it's a money maker for them, you know, but for the, for the native community, we got to We got to step up to the plate. We got to bring more more structure for our, our reservations, you know. We got to police our reservations, and they're doing it. They're doing it the best they can, you know. I love my people, all nations, but it's the fact is that you know you get you know you'll get a couple of them out there that go outside the reservations and they'll bring that in there. But you know, it's our job, you know. We, that's all I got to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. You back. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Moore. We're going to go to round uh, two of uh, the question and answer uh, period. I'd like to uh, begin uh, by coming back to uh, Chief uh, Hoskin. 
um, and, and to ask you uh, regarding uh, your uh, settlement money from the uh, opioid litigation uh, that you uh, won um, from opioid distributors, you could have invested it in any number of ways to help uh, the Cherokee. Why did you choose to use that money to build a clinic? Representative, our goal is to build a comprehensive behavioral health system in the Cherokee Nation with a focus on addiction treatment using the latest and best practices. Investing in capital projects is a great use of those limited uh, opioid industry settlement funds. At Cherokee Nation, we do a great deal of contracting out of our addiction treatment in other words, we look to third parties to provide that treatment. And in many cases, it's very good. But as I mentioned in the response to the earlier question, uh, directly delivering health care services to the Cherokee people by the Cherokee people is the best regardless of ailment. And in the case of addiction treatment, there's something particularly important about Cherokees delivering it to Cherokees because of our shared experience and history. We want to create a system in terms of addiction treatment uh, that provides not only the uh, initial uh, detox type uh, response to addiction, but a long term uh, commitment to healing that includes residential treatment programs that includes getting people back into the workforce that includes uh, making sure that moms and dads can be with their children as they're going through recovery when the setting and situation is appropriate. So these opioid industry dollars will go to build those clinics because I think it's the most effective long term strategy. Cherokees taking care of Cherokees. I should mention that of the opioid settlements, as I mentioned in my testimony, 15 million dollars I've proposed to our council, our legislative branch over the next three years to start building some of these facilities. That won't be enough. That's a minimum number. We'll commit more of those opioid settlement dollars to these efforts but it is a start and it is a start down a path of healing. I should also mention in that same legislation I've proposed to our council, not using the opioid dollars, but using our own third party revenues, we're actually starting a harm reduction program. We're taking an all of, all of the above approach to addressing addiction. And uh, I think we're leaders in that regard in Indian country. Uh, we think those, this investment of opioid settlement dollars will yield so much in a return on investment in the form of opening up opportunities for our people because the opioid epidemic has foreclosed so many opportunities for individuals and really suppressed us collectively. We can change that by making these investments. Uh, thank you for that. If I could just uh, piggyback one more related question uh, on this vein, uh, what opioid recovery services could the Cherokee provide if the federal government's fiduciary trust obligation was fully met? Well, certainly if we had additional operating dollars in particular, we could start, for example, with children. I mean, that is where we find in Indian country, and I think all over the world, you find the greatest hope for your people uh, is in the children. But you also know that children can go down a path that leads them into the same type of challenges, including addiction, that the generation before them uh, ha are dealing with. And so getting involved early in terms of education and prevention uh, is important. Peer recovery is something I'd like to see us do more in the Cherokee Nation. I, I visited our brothers and sisters in the Eastern Band and saw what they were doing in terms of providing uh, addiction treatment and often it involved staff members or even volunteers that themselves were recovering from addiction. There's something very powerful about utilizing people who have been through that direct trauma to provide services to their brothers and sisters. And I think we can do more of that if we had additional operating dollars. I'm very optimistic in that regard. So focusing on youth and focusing on peer counseling there's a host of other things we can do. These uh, facilities that we're building that will take a great deal of staff, recruiting, recruiting people into these professions is also key. Uh, Congressman, I can build all the buildings in the world, but if I can't fill them with the best and brightest of staff and retain them 
I've really not done what we need to do. We've not done what we need to do. So recruiting talent, creating that pipeline of professionals, that's key for Indian country. I think the government of the United States can help us in that regard. Uh, thank you uh, for that. Uh, now I'd like to uh, ask uh, the ranking member if uh, he has uh, more questions. Thank you again, Mr. Garcia. Um, yeah, I do have a few more questions I'll, I'll jump into for, for witness Mr. Del Cueto. Um, so I mentioned Utah in my opening statement. And as I've been in my community and going to the doctor's office, I got young kids. We tend to be there more often than I'd like. I see, you know, a lot of communication. I see posters about this. I see a, a, it's more palpable uh, everything related to opioids and the potential um, negative effects and side effects of this. I'm proud of that. I think that's something to celebrate. I think that's something that we've, we've done well in, this, in society over the last six or seven years. But the point we're trying to make today is that no amount of additional spending or no, no, no additional advertising or physicians being more hyper-focused on this with their individual patients can overcome the, the, the amount of volume that we've seen at our borders over the last year. A 1,066% increase. Okay, so the South Texas ports of entry reported seizing 588 pounds of fentanyl, a 1,066% increase compared to FY 2020. I mean, that's astronomical, right? And that's the point that we're trying to make is Increased education, yes, we need to be doing better as a society. We need to be talking about this more with our families. Absolutely, particularly on, on the reservations. We need to you know, keep seeing the momentum that we've, we, we've seen. But that amount of increase is unsustainable to curb this problem. So again, Mr. Del Cueto, in your opinion, if President Biden does not change his policies, will these drugs remain readily available to be sold on the illegal drug market? Ranking member Moore. We have seen the increase, obviously, what we talk about is the increase in what we have seized, the, the increase in the apprehensions, and they're astronomical. But what people need to continue to concentrate on, and they, some people forget, is with these huge amounts of seizures, there are huge amounts that are getting through. The drugs are still cheap, which means there's a lot of it coming through. And that is a direct effect because of the lack of border security created by the current administration. And, 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 and I'll go on to say, and I've said it many times before, it has nothing to do whether you're on the right side of the aisle or the left side of the aisle. At the end of the day, we all lock our doors at night. We all want security for our families. The reservation wants security for their tribal members. We want security for Americans. The cartels do not care who we voted for. The cartels does not care who is in office. The cartels just want to bring their drugs across. And if we need security in our homes and we care about security of our homes and we lock our doors at night, there should be no different with our borders. This is a nation of laws and we need to feel secure in this country. Thank you for that. And, I, and I'll also highlight um, Mr. Cortez's comments too, where he mentioned there is no discrimination with the cartels. And these drugs do not discriminate. They will, they're an equal opportunity aggressor. Um, on our communities. And um, I guess one, one, one last question that I'll ask with my time is, is, can you describe for the committee the ways in which cartels smuggle drug across the border? Just from your experience, very simply, do they use vehicles or send drugs with migrants or attempting to illegally enter our country? Just give us some perspective there. So the, the, the cartels, they don't care. They'll use vehicles to come across in between the ports. They'll try to smuggle drugs at the ports of entry. They'll use uh, females and, and males as body carriers where they will, you know, carry their, the drug inside their bodies. They will use children. They'll use anything they can to bring drugs into this country because they simply do not care. It is a profit for them. And they see when there's an administration that is allowing that profit to grow by weak border security policies. And with respect to profits, are you monetary, monetarily profit? Profits um, or cartels, do you see that they're still able to profit off of this, this ongoing activity? 
has that been curbed in any way or is that that, that getting worse it's it's gotten worse over the last year and, and as i said you know it's, it doesn't just show with the amount that is being apprehended and the seizures but obviously there's a lot of it getting away the Godaway numbers themselves have gone up in in the southern border and that is a direct effect of the cartels distracting agents from one area so they can bring their drugs in through gaps. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yield back. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Moore. Uh, the chair uh, next uh, would recognize Representative Stansberry. Thank you so much um, to Chair Porter, Representative Garcia, and also to our ranking member for convening this important hearing on such an important topic. I also want to thank all of our witnesses for joining us today and sharing your stories and your work to serve and protect the health and well being of our communities. New Mexico is ground zero for the opioid epidemic. We have one of the highest rates of drug overdose in the United States. In some New Mexico counties, the overdose rates are more than five times the national rate. In 2019 alone, we lost 605 New Mexicans to drug overdoses. That is 605 family members, brothers, sisters, parents, children, coworkers, and neighbors. And every single one of those lives lost was a preventable tragedy. A person who was loved, who was cared for, a part of the fabric of their communities. Opioid addiction touches nearly every New Mexican life as nearly two thirds of our population know someone who is addicted to opioids, including myself. In fact, in 2019, my life was personally changed forever by the opioid epidemic as I lost one of my oldest friends to a fentanyl overdose. An artist, a father, a friend, someone who became addicted like millions of Americans after he received a prescription from his doctor. His story was unique, but also like that of thousands of people across our communities and the tragedies that we've heard about today and that we hear about every single day across the country and across our tribal communities. Our tribes and our pueblos, our governments and law enforcement are working every day to address this crisis, to stem the flow of drugs into our communities and the public safety crisis that is emerged from it, to address the crisis of addiction that is touching every member of our communities and to provide opportunities for healing and addiction recovery. But the system is broken and we need action now. And that is why it is crucial that this body pass legislation and meaningful budgets that will help to enable our communities to fight this crisis at home. Already in this chamber, several bills have been introduced that would help to support our tribal communities. For example, Representative Maloney's CARE Act would award grants to tribes who are disproportionately impacted by high drug overdose rates and help to distribute opioid reversal drugs for tribal communities. I'm also proud to co-sponsor Representative Tonko's Mainstreaming Addiction Treatment Act, which would help community health workers treat substance abuse disorders in their own communities. And within New Mexico, our office is working every day to try to identify how to address the public safety and the public health crisis that has emerged around the opioid epidemic. But in order to address this crisis across our tribal communities, we need an approach that is community-centered, that is culturally relevant, that empowers our communities to make the changes on the ground that they need, whether that is in law enforcement, in youth opportunities, in healthcare services, and in healing opportunities for our communities. And so with that in mind, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to ask Ms. Rosette, because of the important work that you do, especially with our urban Indian organizations, can you please take just a moment to share with us some of the things that you think that this body can do to help support your work on the ground? Well, first, as I, and like I stated, in, um, thank you for the question, and um, as I stated in my testimony, is to include urban Indian organizations in the legislation. Um, funding is always an obstacle for us. Um, grants like the state opioid response grant would allow us to provide culturally appropriate treatment in our, in our community, but we were not included. You have to specifically say urban um, and, along with tribal. Otherwise, we, we are not a, a allowed to get the funding. So we need 
that's what needs to happen is to be included in all these funding um, grants, include urbans and tribal, and then that would assist us with creating to um, help with this crisis. Thank you so much. And uh, for any other members of the panel, is there any additional items that you feel very strongly that this body can do to help support your work on the ground? Folks are being shy here. So I'll just wrap up my uh, my comments here and say thank you for your service and for the important work that you do. And I want to thank the chairman and ranking member for convening this important hearing. It's clear that we have to do everything possible to help empower our communities to provide resources and to address this crisis. Thank you. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Representative uh, Stansberry. Uh, before we go to round uh, three of questions and answers, I just want to point out that the steady increase in fentanyl at the border uh, started in 2016 and increased steadily under President Trump. So this is not a Biden problem. This is a fentanyl problem that we have to grapple with. Um, I'd like to now uh, go to round three and uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, again, uh, back to uh, Chief Hoskins. Uh, can you please explain the roles of uh, pharmaceutical distributors and manufacturers in the tribal opioid crisis? If doctors are prescribing the pills and controlling their distribution, how did the situation get out of control? You know, it's a, uh, thank you, Congressman, it's a fair and natural question to ask uh, if doctors are involved as a point of contact in the pres prescribing of these drugs. Uh, how does that interplay with the opioid industry? Uh, what we know is that doctors don't have a particular uh, idea of other doctors writing the same prescriptions. We know that, but we also know that the opioid industry, the pharmaceutical uh, uh, chains and, and providers in particular had or should have had checks in place uh, to limit, in fact, there are checks in place that should have been uh, adhered to to limit the distribution of these drugs. There should have been flags, there were flags that were raised. They were ignored. They were ignored because of profit. They were ignored because the distributors and manufacturers knew full well uh, the communities they were impacting. I'm talking, of course, about tribal communities, but you could go to other marginalized communities in this country and find a similar targeting. I believe the Indian country was targeted. I believe Cherokee Nation communities were targeted. And I think the stats uh, in many ways speak for themselves. As I mentioned in my testimony, when you have this deluge of pills coming into the reservation, such that you have 153 pills in one year for every man, woman, and child in the Cherokee Nation Reservation. That is indicative of an industry that is driven by profit, not care. And so I would submit that that is the problem. We're getting some measure of justice through our historic litigation. And I have to say that building drug treatment centers using the very funds we have finally extracted from this industry gives us some satisfaction, but more than satisfaction, it gives us a path towards hope. If we can couple that with increased uh, funding streams from the government of the United States that allow us to do what we can do, which is to bring healing to our people, I think we can get on the way again to that idea of holistic healing that Indian country needs, Cherokee Nation in particular needs. Thank you for that. Uh, now I'd like to turn to Ms. Rosette. Uh, when we think about the impacts of opioids, uh, we typically think about death and addiction. Does opioid addiction cause disabilities among American Indian and Alaska Natives as well? And uh, what are they? Can you, re can you repeat that, please? I'm sorry. Yes, uh, usually when we think about uh, opioid addiction, we think about death uh, and uh, addiction. Uh, but my question is, with the opioid crisis, is this causing disabilities among the American Indian or Alaskan uh, Native population 
uh, as well? I believe it is. Um, I believe there's other, you know, there would be um, just the, I believe so. And my answer, I, I need more time to think about it really. Cause I was like, I came out of nowhere. I was like, I'm, I sure I, I used to deal with um, Pete or clients that had that. And oftentimes it created some mental health condition or they went hand in hand. So there's that, but, and they were not able to work. And so there, there are disabilities, but there's um, it depends on the, the length, I guess, and how hard it hit them. So there's many, um, there's, lots of answers to that, I guess. And I believe there are other disabilities. Okay, thank you. And one final a quick uh, question for uh, Chief Hoskin. Uh, in your testimony, uh, you said that between uh, 2015 and 2016, there were enough opioid pills to give every man, woman, and child on your land, 153 pills each. Did those pills come illegally over the border? Mr. Chairman, not, not to my knowledge. Uh, I mean, our focus has been on the, the uh, source of the pills coming from your neighborhood pharmacy or more often because of their size, the chains. I am assuming that uh, Walgreens didn't get their uh, pills from across the border. I'm assuming they got them from normal distribution channels. Uh, we have had to check that enormous amount of pills coming into the Cherokee Reservation from businesses and corporations that have seen fit to profit uh, off the uh, pain imposed uh, by their own actions. Thank you, sir. Uh, the chair uh, now recognizes the ranking member for a third round. Mr. Chair, may I ask that uh, the Texas, the gentleman from Texas, Tony Gonzalez, go first? Uh, absolutely. Uh, the gentleman from uh, Texas, Mr. Gonzalez, is recognized. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and uh, thank you, Ranking Member, for for allowing me to uh, to uh, be on this this uh, hearing today. Uh, you know, I represent 42 percent of the southern border, uh, a large part, and uh, you know this uh, this crisis is forefront in everything that I see. And one of the things that that uh, that I, I see regularly is the coordination between uh, Border Patrol agents and tribes and and pueblos. I, I represent part of. Uh, the Tiguas out in uh, El Paso County. Uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Del, uh, Del Cueto. And, uh, you know, can you describe, part of what worries me is the morale and of the, the Border Patrol Agency in, in general. Uh, can you describe the toll, the policies that are taking place on the Border Patrol agents that you work with? Uh, what, what is morale like? And, and, and I'll, I'll just preface, that you know, on Christmas Day, I, I did a swing through the district, visited six different stations, uh, three different sectors, and and one of the things I, I heard was Border Patrol agents have, uh, in, in in particular, have a mandatory six day overtime, and you know, I don't care what line of work you in, if you're working six days with with no end in sight, that has to that has to cause some damage. But uh, you know, what what is the morale like uh, there in Border Patrol with this uh, this crisis? Well, to be honest, yeah, it is a sixth day of overtime that they're working, but it's not to be out there on the field protecting our nation's borders. It's more so to be processing the huge number of individuals that have come into the country. And, you know, yes, there's been a problem with drugs coming through the Tejano Autumn Nation and different nations and the southern border for quite some time. But now when you look at it, everything you see on the news, it's constantly, you know, one load after another load of either fentanyl or heroin or cocaine. It, it's gone through astronomical numbers than it ever has before. And it's evident because, you know, you have agents that are too busy having to do the processing because the cartels, as I said, they know what they're doing. Listen, I've, I've been down here my whole life. I've seen it. I've seen it through different administrations. This is the worst we've seen. The agents have shown it. The agents are fed up. They're tired. They're, we have agents that are, you know, leaving leaving the agency more than before you speak to them constantly and say you know it's 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 we can't hold up at this pace a couple of years ago individuals were worried of whether they were going to call it a crisis should we call it a crisis should we call it chaos i don't think it matters at this point what we're going to call it there's too many individuals that have been dying on both sides of the border there's too many individuals americans as a whole that have been dying and something needs to be done and when you look at the policies that are currently going on of the catch and release, and you're seeing huge numbers of individuals from all over the world 
that are coming across. Some of them, they'll stay on the, on the border themselves. They'll have agents that will come to the line. They'll transport them to areas so they can process them. And the rest of the group, they stay there. They don't even leave. They stay there and they say, I'm just waiting for the ride. Right. The agents that picked up the other group are coming right back to pick up the other group. Yeah, no, I, 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 transport. yeah, no, I appreciate, I appreciate all the, uh, we appreciate all the hard work that your agents are doing to, to keep us all safe. Uh, you know, my next, my next, uh, question is about coordination. Can you, can you speak a little bit about, uh, what kind of coordination that you have with, uh, tribes or, or Pueblos? And, and once again, I'll go back to the Tiguas because they represent, uh, a, a portion of that border area and, and they always are talking about you know some of the coordination that the border patrol has uh curious how are things going on that end so so you obviously have coordination there's different radio communications that could be a problem at times and, and i'll just share this story with you just a couple of weeks ago border patrol was trying to stop a vehicle that was known to be smuggling uh individuals coming across the border as they were behind that vehicle the driver of the vehicle at 80 miles an hour on the tohono Autumn reservation decided to start throwing the individuals he was transporting out the vehicle while it was still moving agents had to stop and assist these individuals that obviously had they had to have medical attention the tohono Autumn reservation assisted they later found that vehicle abandoned in one of the villages with a, a weapon inside the car uh, i do not know or i do not believe that the individual that uh, was driving has been captured but that is something that we see here every day it's not the numbers it's not of who's coming across and who's not we're seeing the chaos on the border we're seeing the chaos on the nation and it's there has never been a time more chaotic than there has been during this administration uh, well thank you uh, agent del cueto and and thank you chairman for for the time and the opportunity to uh, to be at this hearing today and i yield back Thank you, uh, Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, the chair would uh, next uh, recognize uh, Mr. Westerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the witnesses, and thank you for at least having a hybrid uh, uh, hearing today. You know, the uh, the border crisis is exacerbating our nation's um, opioid crisis, and I think with all the other crises going on in the world. It's kind of masking what's really happening at the at the border. Um, we're not only facing a surging number of migrants, but increasing amounts of illicit substances. Um, and you know, as has been already stated in here, fentanyl is is one of the uh, um, one of those substances that's doing great damage in our country. And to think that we've apprehended enough fentanyl to uh, give a lethal dose to every American citizen is just, it's, it's outrageous. And uh, Mr. Del Cueto, uh, the deadly drug we know can, a lethal dose can be just two milligrams. It, this seems to me not like just a, uh, a national security issue, but a public uh, safety issue. And can you describe the concerns that you have specifically about fentanyl flowing into our country? Obviously, the deaths that we've spoken about, but at the same time, you have agents that are out there having to arrest these people. They're having to have to. They're having to deal with uh, some of the um, fentanyl that they seize. There's a limited number of Narcan uh, setups out there, which is the pretty much the injection that you would get if you were directly in in contact with fentanyl. Uh, there's there's we see the problem constantly. We see it at the at the checkpoints. You know, you, you open up the news and you constantly see body carriers coming across. And yes, there's there's pills. It's in powder form. It's different ways that they're bringing it across. And, you know, as somebody else on the panel earlier spoke, that it's, it's hard to tell uh, where it's coming from. But I can tell you by being down here, I'm seeing the number of those illicit drugs coming through our southern border higher than they have ever been before. And that was going to be a, a question I ask you. Do you see it uh, improving or getting worse? And obviously, um, it's it's getting worse. And we we talk a lot about uh, hockey stick charts in this committee, 
uh, how how steep is the increase um, from your experience on the number of illicit drugs that are being seized? And what would you say is the number one driving force behind this increase? I'd have to look into the numbers specifically to, to give you a percentage. Uh, I don't have those numbers, so I can't give you. I, I'd hate to give you a number that you know was incorrect, but I, I can tell you that we're seeing a huge amount compared to other years, and a lot of it is because agents are being distracted. And I will add that, yeah, a lot of people focus on what is being detained, and they say, hey, the numbers of what is being seized is huge, which is correct. But at the same time, when you're seeing the amount of gotaways that are coming through our border, and then you realize that a lot of these gotaways, they're waiting for agents to be out of the area, so the cartels are the ones that are directly, directly sending them across, the number that's getting through is astronomical. And right. it's obvious because they're all working with the cartels themselves. So do you see a correlation between the number of uh, illegal migrants that you're detaining uh, along with the number of, uh, of the, the quantity of illegal drugs that's being uh, stopped at the border? M most definitely. So it's, uh, you know, we hear the term so often, catch and release. Individuals are coming across, they realize that if they come in big numbers, they'll have to distract agents from the areas that they're working. Now they have to transport them. During that entire time, there's gaps on our southern border. And those gaps are the ones that are utilized by the cartels. They're exploited by the cartels, not just with illegal drugs coming across, but sex trafficking, the human trafficking, the unaccompanied children. They'll distract agents with unaccompanied children. They'll drop a, a huge group of unaccompanied children in one area, knowing agents are having to respond to there, that now they're having to transport them. All the while, as they leave, you see the gotaway numbers go up, and that is where some of these you know, other individuals are coming across and or the drugs. And if the administration goes through with their, uh, their current plans on the border, what do you expect to see happen to both the number of uh, illegal migrants and the, the amount of fentanyl coming across the border? It'll become a free for all. And basically what will be happening is we'll be handing over the key to the front door, to the drug traffickers, to the human traffickers and the sex trafficking in this country. Yeah, well, I'm out of time, but thank you for what you and all your colleagues do. I've been to the border several times and it's just, it's even more eye opening every time I go. And I think if the, uh, if the general public could see what we see as members of Congress, there would be a huge outrage about what's happening on the southern border and our policies there. I yield back. Uh, gentlemen, yield back. Uh, Mr. Gomert uh, of Texas is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Del Cueto, with regard to uh, border states, in particular Arizona, you do have part of our international border with Mexico that runs through tribal lands there in Arizona. Are you familiar with that area? I am, Congressman. That is the area I specifically have been uh, working for over 18 years. That is the Tejano Autumn Nation. It's over 60 linear miles with uh, the Mexican border. Uh, have you seen any problems uh, with the drug cartels using that area for bringing in drugs? Definitely, there's a, there's, they scout, they put scouts on both sides of the border uh, many times in order so, so they can coordinate the drug trafficking uh, that they're bringing into the United States. It, it happens continuously and uh, they exploit that area specific because they know it's uh, one, the, the barrier in that area is, is less than anywhere else it is, specifically in Tucson sector. And at the same time, there's different gaps that they can get through. There's different villages that they utilize on tribal land to assist them with bringing their drugs across. Uh, is there a difference in Border Patrol's ability to patrol that area of the border that runs through tribal lands as opposed to those areas that uh, are with Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, California? So when, when you're working with tribal land, there's different rules. There's different things that you must respect. 
Some of it, you know, is sacred land that, you know, they're very proud of, which is very much understandable. Uh, so there's different ways that you have to go about patrolling in, the, in those spots. There's also limit of coverage at times when it comes to radio traffic, uh, because you just can't just put towers wherever you want. So there is, you know, definitely there's, it's a different way to work there. A lot of the agents out there, they're still using the old method of tracking. So they track the drug smugglers through. Many times they'll, they'll, they'll be tracking drug smugglers all the way to uh, some kind of highway where they lose track of them. And those are some of our gotaways. Uh, there's different methods that, that they use to track to be able to recognize if some of these individuals may be carrying backpacks of, of drugs or regular backpacks. Um, there's just different methods. I would hate to go into it because I don't want to give any more information to the drug traffickers themselves so they can know what we're looking for. Well, do you see any solutions that should be pursued uh, that are not being in that area? So that definitely, obviously, tell us funding, about? obviously more funding when it comes to uh, some kind of barriers so you can funnel individuals in the, in the correct place. That, that's that's a huge plus. More prosecutions of the individuals when they do get detained and, and get arrested. And at the same time, you know, you have to imply other immigration uh, policies. It's a domino effect. But when you're telling individuals that they can enter this country illegally and there will be no consequences for their actions, that uh, is pretty much inviting people to come here, break the law, and the, the cartels are aware of that. So obviously the remain in Mexico policy is something huge. Maybe bring some more immigration judges and or asylum officers down there so they can see a lot of these cases for asylum are not true asylum claims. And that way they can have agents actually working these areas to stop the flow of drugs that are entering our country. Uh, do you think it would help to have immigration judges right there on the border working in shifts so that you could give people immediate hearings as soon as they were uh, obtained or taken in custody? Definitely. When you do something like that, you send a clear message to the drug smugglers. You, sell, you send a clear message to the human smugglers that the United States is not going to tolerate individuals just false claiming to come into the United States. When you do that, it'll lower the flow. When and, and, and I know people get upset, but the reality is when President Trump first took over office, he lowered those numbers just by rhetoric alone. Right now, rhetoric is not going to do it. We need policies that are going to affect this change. And we owe that to the tribal people that are on, the, on this uh, panel. We owe it to the tribal lands. We owe it to all Americans, frankly. And again, well, the cartels... One, one last question very quickly, though. Uh, does that affect just the areas on the border? Does it affect the whole country? It affects the entire country. The drug cartels are making money off of people in the entire country. They transport their drugs everywhere in the United States. Uh, thank you very much. Appreciate all you do for us. Thank you. Gentlemen, uh, yields. Uh, the chair would now recognize the uh, ranking member Moore. Thank you again, chair. Um, let, let me reiterate just one more time that we're not denying that there's a role that you know, pharmaceutical companies can play in, in improving this situation. And I think we've seen that play out over the last several years. What we're trying to hit, the, the point we're trying to continue to make is that the abundance of drugs coming across our southern border will make it so we can't get out ahead of this issue, that it will continually be compounded on, on itself and not just border states, but every state in our nation will continually face this epidemic. Um, President Biden's, and I'll read from this, President Biden's DEA administrator, Pointy Ann Milgram, stated in, this, in, in the alert that we have here, the United States is facing an unprecedented crisis of overdose deaths fueled by illegally manufactured fentanyl. DEA is focusing resources on taking down the violent drug traffickers causing the greatest harm. Okay? That's President Biden's appointee in the DEA. And, and Mr. Del Cueto, I want to continue talking just about solutions, but focus it specifically on, on how the DEA can best support patrol, Border Patrol agents. Could you share with us your thoughts on, on again, how the DEA can best support uh, Border Patrol agents? I think a lot of it could happen if there was a more communication and more working together with this. 
Uh, obviously, there's, it's two different entities, it's two different departments, uh, but uh, we have to work hand in hand, as, as I've said. It, it's not something that just one particular party you know, is, is, is going to help and the cartels don't care what party you're at. Uh, I know I've done several different uh, tours out here on the southern border. We've gone down to the Tohono O'odham Nation many times, congressmen, some of them that, are, that have spoken here today. They've taken that trip. They've seen the problem. And they can see the gaps that are happening. They can see what's coming through. And it's going to take a joint effort, not just by Border Patrol and DEA. It's going to take a joint effort by in, all individuals that actually truly want to do something about it. Uh, it's, it's a hard subject because people are, you know, they get upset or they look at one thing about, you know, the uh, traffic from uh, human traffic that's coming through the border. But it goes hand in hand. It's a domino effect. And I've said it many times, and I will continue saying it. You know, we owe it to the future of Americans. Um, illegal is not a race. Uh, it comes down to we all need to get together. And, and if we really care about stopping the flow of drugs, we're going to have to focus on policies that have been enacted, allowing individuals to come across the border without any consequences. And we'll see from many of my colleagues not just from border states, but we've seen a direct call um, for two of these policies that you mentioned. Particularly, I'll mention the Remain in Mexico policy. This should have been, this should not have been a hyper-partisan issue. This should not have been, this should, should have been something that President Biden was willing to embrace for the exact reasons that we're talking about today. From our witness, Mr. Del Cueto, and from the majority's witness, Mr. Cortez, there's no discrimination of this drug. They will, it will hit everybody. Um, those policies did not need to be hyper politicized and they just needed to be enforced. Um, and Title 42 is what's currently taking place. Do you have any th thoughts on my, uh, my last 60 seconds or so on those particular, those two policies and anything else that you would say that, that the, um, would make the biggest difference to improve Border Patrol agents' ability to secure our borders? Th those two policies alone will have tremendous impact because it'll send a clear message that you cannot just come across, claim asylum and be released in the United States waiting for a court date later on. So that's a huge deal. When you do that, at the, the illegal alien flow in those areas that are distractive, a, distracting agents will come down and thus agents will be able to interdict the fentanyl that's coming into our country and killing Americans in every single state of our country, not just on the border. Thank you, sir. Now you're back. My uh, ranking member yields back. Uh, the chair will recognize Mr. Rosendale. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Chairman Porter and Acting Chair Garcia and Ranking Member Moore for putting this hearing on today. Also, thank you to all the witnesses for joining us and for your testimony on this important issue. We've heard a lot of testimony today about how Big Pharma is responsible for the opioid crisis and rampant drug addiction in the United States. While these pharmaceutical companies may share some of the blame, we cannot ignore the issue of our poor southern border and raging border crisis. Joe Biden's failed immigration policy has empowered Mexican cartels to smuggle fentanyl and drugs across the southern border undeterred killing over 100,000 Americans last year alone. Make no mistake, the border and immigration crisis in our nation is at the worst point that we've ever seen. I met with my state's attorney general for the last two weeks, and he said that 100% of the fentanyl and methamphetamine entering Montana is coming across the southern border. In fiscal 21, 11,000 pounds of fentanyl was seized by CBP, enough to give a legal dose to every American. And this year alone, 173 pounds has been confiscated at the border. Unfortunately, tribal communities do often face the brunt of this burden in the fight against opioids and addiction. Mr. Del Cueto, thank you so much for joining us again today. It's always good to be with you. Thank you for securing our southern border. Do you think that this will help tribal communities and American communities by reducing the prevalence of fentanyl and drugs securing our southern border? It most, it most definitely will. 
Uh, we've seen it before that, you know, when different policies are enacted, the cartels, they, they try to get a different way to bring their product across where agents are able to interdict it. And uh, right now, as I stated earlier, it is a free for all. Getting, and getting rid of Title 42 authority is handing over the key to the drug cartels. Do you get any feedback from the attorney generals around our nation on what kind of time frame it takes from these drugs to enter our country until they are being distributed around the entire nation? No, I, I haven't gotten that feedback from them. Um, I, I don't know, maybe the, the individuals that run the agency, they may have gotten some type of feedback. I haven't. Uh, all I can testify to is I see the amount of drugs that are coming through. You see the issues that are happening throughout the, the country. You see it in the news. And, you know, the drug cartels, uh, they're aware of policies that are enacted in the U.S. and they use whatever they can to bring their drugs across. Right now, it happens to be, you know, the, the catching and releasing of individuals and distracting agents from one area to the other with a huge volume of uh, people that they bring across. Unfortunately, I, I have spoke with the attorney general about this issue, and, and apparently the cartels are operating with the efficiency of UPS, and it takes approximately 48 hours for those drugs to cross the southern border before they are distributed around Montana. Are there reasonable estimations of the amount of fentanyl that came across the southern border that was not seized? There is, isn't, and I, and I know that's that's not a, a good answer, but I will tell you what often happens is the way you, you track the gotaways, uh, one, it could be used with sensor, it could be used with cameras, but oftentimes uh, the drug cartels are aware of where, where some of these things are, so they'll, they'll go through different areas, so it could be as uh, rudimentary as just counting footprints in the sand. Uh, so uh, it is a guesstimate on the number of gotaways, and it would be a complete guesstimate on the amount of drugs that are coming through. However, when you see that the price of fentanyl, the price of heroin, the price of meth uh, is, is still cheap in America, that is because there's a huge supply coming through. What are the uh, relationships that CBP have with the tribal law enforcement and what can be done to improve those to try and get some kind of collaboration in the uh, law enforcement efforts to, to reduce this uh, fentanyl problem uh, it, it comes down to you know obviously you're dealing with federal lands but when agents arrest some of these uh, individuals that are bringing drugs into the country if uh, it would fail to meet any prosecution head uh, prosecution guideline within the federal government that uh, the, the local tribal land might be able to take over the case very good and as the conditions continue to uh, deteriorate as we speak, what would you take as your main priority uh, uh, message to, to this body? We need to enact policies or bring back policies that were under effect before that lowers the amount of individuals coming across, that there's actually consequences for them. And as always, if anybody wants to come down here, I know you and, and several other congressmen have taken me up on the offer and they've come down here and they've seen the reality. Uh, when you come down here and you see the reality of what's happening and how those gaps have been made under the current administration, perhaps individuals will see the difference. Thank you so much. And Mr. Chair, I would yield back. Gentlemen, yield back. Um, a little food for thought. Uh, drug smugglers themselves, uh, with respect to this uh, topic, uh, tell a different story. Uh, El Chapo's uh, cartel members testified that uh, they move high value drugs through ports of entry, not across the border. The numbers back that up. Uh, border Patrol agents, for example, seized 332 pounds of fentanyl in 2018, while customs officers at ports seized 1,357 pounds again this is not a border problem. This is an opioid problem. So just to enrich in the conversation. Uh, but before we conclude with uh, this uh, witness panel, are there any members who have not had their five minutes who seek recognition to ask questions now? If not, I thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. The members of the committee may have some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond uh, to these in writing. 
under committee's rule, uh, committee rule three uh, zero, uh, members of the committee uh, must submit questions within three business days following the hearing, and the hearing, hearing record will be held open for 10 business days uh, for these responses. If there's no further uh, uh, with if, in, in business without objection, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>